this story starts like so many stories in my life with a call from my mother. <laughs> On this particular day, she was calling to tell me about an epiphany she'd had about a young woman that works for her that she'd been having a difficult time, let's say, relating to. The epiphany went something like this. Honey, she's a millennial. You know how they can be, right? I pause so my confusion can breathe. And then I remind my mom, Mom, I'm a millennial. So is my brother. Your boss? <laughs> oh, honey, you're different, she says. You're not entitled or spoiled at all. I wanted to agree with my mother about my lack of entitlement in that moment. But then I remembered I needed her to drop off that dress she had just sewn for me because I never had to learn how to sew. <laughs> I hang up the phone and I am perplexed. I am perplexed that a woman who has raised three successful millennials could so quickly jump on the criticism train. And I am perplexed because I have had this very conversation so many times in my life. Take my coworker who's complaining about their millennial employee until I go, hey, I'm a millennial. To which they respond, oh, you're different. <laughs> you're a leader. You're mature. You're an old soul. <laughs> you know it. You're different. So maybe I am different. I decided I would do a little research to prove that I must be better than the run-of-the-mill millennial. And a little research turned into a lot of research. I read article after article and research paper after research paper, and here's what I discovered. Not only am I a millennial, I'm a super millennial. <laughs> I'm like an 11 on a scale of 1 to 10 of the characteristics that make up my generation. So what is it? Why, when I remind people of my millennialism, do they counter my argument with anecdotes about maturity and leadership as if being a leader and being a millennial are mutually exclusive? And then it hit me. If most people think that being a leader and being a millennial cannot coexist, maybe they assume I must be different because they're judging me through a filter of leadership first and millennial second. For context, I've held high-level leadership positions for much of my career. At the age of 26, I was a CFO at a state agency. Now, at the age of 32, I'm a vice president in a Fortune 50 company. So while I had set out on this research journey to prove that to be a great leader, a millennial must be uniquely different than the average, what I found is that it's the characteristics of the average that make a great leader. One study I read even said, young leaders rank in the top quartile at a rate more than twice that of their older peers. And so I wonder, were millennials raised to lead? <laughs> Now, depending on your own generational allegiances, you might be currently panicking about the idea of working for some 140-character talking spoiled brat whose parents told them they were special, no matter what they did. <laughs> Thanks, Mom and Dad. <laughs> the reality is, millennials will make up more than 50% of the workforce by the year 2020, and will be the overwhelming majority by the year 2025. Now, I am certain that over the span of time, every generation has looked at the one coming up behind them and thought the world was going to hell. <laughs> But somehow, my generation has become the most studied in history. I think this is because we are quickly becoming the majority in the most multi-generational workforce in history. In many organizations, there are four generations working alongside each other right now at the same time. Boomers, Gen Xers, Millennials, and now even Generation Z. And this millennial takeover has been disruptive. American corporations are paying millions of dollars a year to study our buying patterns and our habits around the media. Companies pay consultants <laughs> to tell them how to hire us, how to work with us, how to retain these revolutionaries of the participation trophy. And with this heightened awareness has come many criticisms and stereotypes that some of you might be familiar with. One common stereotype is that us millennials cannot put down our damn phones. <laughs> I'll admit, it is the last thing I check at night. It's the first thing I check in the morning, even before getting out of bed. 
But some people think that means that we are disengaged or disinterested in the real world outside of our technology and social media and the immediate gratification of people liking what we're doing, what we're wearing, what we're eating. But what those people are forgetting is that we were the first generation to be technologically connected. And with this connection comes great possibility. It is an asset to be connected to a global market you can leverage quickly for answers to questions you might have about your business. Brian Tracy, who is a respected leadership trainer and author, said, leaders have the ability to anticipate trends well in advance of their competitors. They're continually asking themselves, based on what's happening today in the market, where are we going? Where are we likely to be in three months and six months and one year and two years? For me, if I need to test an app or a promotional idea that we're thinking about, I get to go to Facebook and ask my many very close friends <laughs> what they think. For a quarterly book club I do with my staff, I can just hit Twitter to get recommendations on the best new reads. I have access to perfect strangers who I can leverage to ask questions I am sure I would have never thought of. When leveraged wisely, social media is like this powerful, internationally connected executive coach, free of charge. Technology has made our generation smaller than the preceding generations. We see the world as accessible, and we leverage this accessibility across a powerful network to help us think strategically, to anticipate trends and how those trends might affect our companies. It's this connection to our great networks in the sky that we can pair perfectly with the leadership mentality that we possess, collaboration. A Gartner research study found that millennials are naturally collaborative. We were raised with these schedules that were packed full of team sports and hours of team events. What was playtime to a Gen Xer became the play date for a millennial. We were brought up being taught that you work alongside others to solve problems. On the contrast, that same Gartner research study found that Gen Xers and Boomers actually valued working individually. The stereotype goes, millennials need others to do work we should probably be able to do ourselves. This is one of the stereotypes that I'm saying is furthest from the truth. And the leadership publications agree with me. Leadership publications say collaboration is a highly valued characteristic in today's leader. The Harvard Business Review says, Great leaders must leverage the strengths of their teams to create an environment that is collaborative and flexible so that people want to work together to achieve organizational outcomes. And millennials, we're wired this way. When used properly, we can be naturally collaborative leaders who understand how to use the strengths of people to build successful teams. It's this mindset of collaboration that often challenges the traditional career journeys which are heavily reliant on tenure and individual success. While millennials are less concerned with hierarchy or even our own role within a hierarchy, this brings my favorite stereotype, entitlement. <laughs> the truth is we are less concerned with pay and status than previous generations. And we're actually disillusioned by these structures that emphasize title and tenure as being important to become a decision maker. You see, we report that our parents included us in decision making throughout our childhood at a much higher rate than any other generation. On the contrary, studies show that Gen Xers and Boomers value a more of a control and command management style, and that they see their bosses as the experts. Millennials do not attach any one person in a hierarchy to having all the answers, but think about it. We've been able to quickly get answers to our questions our entire lives with devices that we hold in our hand. This means we look at knowledge and the path to gain it differently. We've been able to disconnect from the idea that time on job is a necessary part of the formula to gain the knowledge you might need to be an effective leader. I recognize that this is incredibly frustrating for some Gen Xers who have waited their seat for their seat at the table 
or for some boomers who built these tables and then established all the rules for us to gain entry. <laughs> Equally as frustrating is that we reject traditional motivation tactics like pay increases and bonuses. Stereotype goes that we're unmotivated or that we're disloyal to companies. We are not unmotivated. We are motivated differently. We find our loyalties in the purpose of the work that we do for a company, not necessarily in the company itself. 30% of millennial managers said meaningful work is important. This compared to only 12% of Gen X and Boomer managers. An intelligence group study found that 64% of millennials said they would rather work for $40,000 a year doing a job they love than $100,000 a year doing a job they found boring. This might explain why we live with our parents at a higher rate. <laughs> When connected or driving towards purpose, millennials are no less loyal than any of the generations that came before us. This desire to connect to purpose comes from being raised with a pursuit of our passions and relationships at the forefront. We were the first generation to be widely told, you can be anything. Our parents put the full force of their financial support and their time behind us pursuing our passions since we were this big. And we've carried that with us into the workforce. The world's most famous millennial leader, Mark Zuckerberg, recently demonstrated this behavior in his $19 billion acquisition of WhatsApp. Despite criticism from the market that this deal was largely overpriced, he referenced his relationship with the WhatsApp founder and their mutual desire to connect across the world as reasons for the deal when discussing this with the investment community. The WhatsApp founder said, yeah, I can confirm that. Monetization of my company was not top of mind in making this deal. Listen, this is a complete shift in cultural ideals. Millennials' desire to connect to passion and purpose and to build relationships has dramatically changed the marketplace, changes the way we talk about brand equity. Now it's changing the way leaders make decisions about their businesses. Millennial researchers Dr. Michael Hayes and Morley Winograd said, in the future, most Americans taking their cue from millennials will demonstrate the behavior and the desire to advance the welfare of the group and be less concerned with individual success. So while I am saying there is a clear connection between leadership characteristics and the characteristics of the millennial generation, What I'm not saying is that we are completely blameless in all these stereotypes that people have about us. If you are a millennial, do not go into your office on Monday and tell your boss that you were born to lead and that you're going to take your seat at the table. <laughs> Instead, look at the research. Look at yourself. How are your millennial characteristics showing up every day? Do people see you as passionate and collaborative? Do they see you as a forward thinker? Do they see you as a leader? If not, how do you change these perceptions by leveraging all that is great about our generation? And if you are not a millennial, you play a role in this too. First of all, some of you raised us, damn it. <laughs> Take that conversation with my mom. She will excuse away all my entitled behavior as being not millennial. Are you too filtering your peers and your employees through this filter of bias about millennials? A Forbes article says millennial leaders will have a very difficult time gaining credibility with their peers because they are viewed as inexperienced and because of preconceived connotations. Are you also dismissing all the characteristics you like, or dare I say admire, about your millennial employees and coworkers as being non-millennial so you can continue to justify these stereotypes? I think to get this multi-generational thing right, we're all going to have to dig a little deeper. Now, maybe in the last 15 minutes, 
I haven't been able to convince you, even with my record 2,000 characters, <laughs> that millennials are great leaders. Maybe all I did was convince you that you're going to retire before we gain the majority share. <laughs> Either way, millennials will make up the most of the leadership positions really soon. And as Hazen Winograd said, as millennials become CEOs or influence the fate of those who are, we will require that companies change their priorities so that we can bring them into alignment with the beliefs and values of our generation. I'll take it a step further and say, to my millennial partners, let's bring leadership into alignment with the beliefs and values of our generation. Let's leverage all that is unique and wonderful about our generation to be tomorrow's next great leader. Let's continue to be taught by those who desire to teach us. Combined with our natural instincts, we're going to change leadership culture across the world. Thank you.